Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show, episode number 337, I'm going to say, 337, with me, your host, Agostino. Welcome back to the show. As per usual, if it's your first time listening via the lovely old podcast app, whether it's Overcast or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever else exists out there, make sure you leave me a five-star review and share with your friends. If you're watching via the YouTubes, of course, smash that like, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. That'll be more than welcomed. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Hey, it's the weekend after Super Saturday for us here in the UK. You know where all the bars and pubs flung open their doors to a whole army of waiting, desperately thirsty patrons who are eager to, you know, have their mouths directly underneath a faucet whilst a lovely bartender or two sprays beer within their face or all over their faces, into their eyes, up their noses and all over their ears. It didn't really transpire that way. I think for the most part it went away. It went out with that hitch really, innit? I didn't really hear many stories, many um occasions of people going a little bit crazy or nuts. There were some stories of people getting injured doing, you know, little games and feeling a bit of Dutch courage, but for the most part it went off without a hitch really and it i think we've probably been maybe the uk as an example of the level of corona ptsd we're all suffering from i think people have been locked indoors for so long that once they were given a little bit of freedom instead of you know kind of throwing it all away and kind of rinsing it down the drain they were instead like you know let me be responsible let me be an adult let me actually treat this like the opportunity that it is and just savor it for the moment that it is and maybe as well you know part of me thinks all this time spent indoors all this time you know hanging out in parks and you know living the living the continental street life has probably changed people's ideas associations when it comes to drinking and going outside and having a bit of fun maybe that's the thing too my collar's a bit messed up maybe yeah so maybe some people just were like you know what i'm not even gonna bother going out what's the point i know i was um i didn't necessarily go to a bar i ended up going to pirate studios for the weekend did a bit of mixing hanged out there for a bit um it was fully booked for the most part but you know i didn't really see a different sort of vibe in there people just carried on as per usual so that was good to see and i don't know having people's overall habits and lifestyles and maybe the way they go about life and how they interact is probably changed for the better maybe with this whole corona maybe that's been a good thing about it you know it sort of altered people's perspective and how they or altered how people interact with the spaces around them around them i would say so you know who knows who knows i'm just uh pontificating here but before we kick off the show i thought the best place to start would be to throw out a little bit of support to the sub club in glasgow i've never actually been um it's always a place i've kind of intended to go to one day surely but surely but um news has come out that they are facing closure actually so they're trying to crowdsource some funds to enable them to stay open at least until december and um yeah i just thought you know you guys should be aware of this and if you can spare a few shekels send it your send it over their way because they're desperately in need of it this is an article from resident advisor it says as much it's a sub club glasgow set of for a co-founding campaign to help avoid closure um, it says sub club is at risk of clo- closing down permanently the glasgow institution temporarily shut during coronavirus pandemic has launched a save our club campaign to help the venue avoid closing for good after more than three decades on the crowdfunder page the venue's team shares a breakdown of the cost to account for the goal of ninety thousand, which is now close to meeting and discusses the uk home office administration errors have put them in an even more precarious position it's pretty astounding and pretty worrying that essentially all it takes is 90,000 well not all it takes but you know it's a st- sounds sure man don't get me wrong but it's not in the millions to keep one of the you know one of the most important clubs in Glasgow opened or in the scene in general which helps to you know sustain the lifestyles and the careers of various different people from door pickers to security to people working in the sound and you know audio and people working with the sound team and making sure the maintenance of that stuff is all right the event bookers um the bar managers on the day the djs that played it the resident djs like all it takes is ninety thousand, and the government couldn't come in and sort of essentially rescue them or essentially give them some sort of payment they'd have to kind of raise the funds from their community which is good don't get me wrong it's great that they have a community but the fact that the government couldn't step in and save this institution is a really really bad indictment to what's going on with corona because if we if we if we're to believe 
that things um things are probably not gonna get better anytime soon right we're probably gonna have to live with this for a while and make some sort of adjustments here and there there should be something in place some sort of i don't know what do you call it some sort of fund right something that um cultural institutions can sort of dip into to allow them to essentially you know survive the next up and coming few months wherever it may be but we don't have it at the moment instead we just have this weird situation where bars and clubs are essentially being beholden and sort of like at risk of closing and if their community doesn't band around and chip in they're essentially gone for good and then the same people that are complaining that they're gone for good will be the ones that are not paying in. It's just a real cluster fucker situation. But I'm glad they've sorted it out. But anyway, the statement continues. It says, um, We have faced countless um, other challenges over the years and are currently still fighting a long term, no, a long running and costly legal battle over noise issues arising from the grant of planning permission for a hotel development directly adjacent to the club, all of which have meant that the subclub has been very much a labor of love for the concerned for more than three decades. It says, however, none of this situation hold a candle to existential threat that COVID-19 pandemic has uh, currently posed to a subclub and indeed the, sub the club culture as a whole around the globe. It continues as the level of the UK government support has been fallen woefully, sh woefully short uh, of what is required to protect the future of the subclub this week long after countries announced uh, extended relief packages the uk government committed to sharing uh, 1.75 billion pandemic support packages for the arts we are very unaware um that many people are experiencing real financial difficulties and for some the threat of the health and well-being of profound we have had to think long and hard before reaching out for the help nevertheless we want to save our club we find ourselves in a situation where we have to ask for support yeah that must be a really tricky situation to be in if you're the owner right you don't want to you don't want to come across insensitive and you also don't want to come across like you're asking for handouts at a time when everyone needs a handout right everyone's struggling in their own little way and um, regardless of where you may fall in the economic ladder right we all kind of are dependent on other people doing work to allow us to make our money in certain ways shape or form right we're all kind of weirdly interconnected in this capitalist society that we're living in so you'd hope that you don't have to you know resort to asking your community for assistance you'd hope the government can sort of step in and see the value that you bring to society right so that when the so, so when um everything does settle down and things need to get back to normal would they have institutions ready to go to kind of welcome people and essentially take their money and feed it back into the government but they don't do that instead they just leave you out on your lurches leave you out on your own have to figure out by yourself and luckily luckily they have a community that can sort of band around and sort of kind of you know gather them as they are and sort of help them and so far i think from what i've seen the support has been i think it's about seventy thousand now at the moment last time i checked oh wow it's already surpassed this goal it seems like right oh wow okay now they've got a new stretch goal of 150,000. before it was 90 so they've uh, way over so way past their immediate goal so if you can support them make sure you do i'll leave a link down below in the show in the description so you can check out yourself but it's definitely a worthy cause and again i think the way that we treat sub club is the way that we're going to go treat all the other clubs around the country and i think the fact that we're going to be able to save sub club is also going to send a message to other parts of our country to let them know that you know we're not going to stand for the government just to be woefully you know um ignorant on not taking the attention as to what kind of value nightlife culture brings to the economy so that when stuff does get restarted we're in a place that we can sort of you know get back on the horse so for lack of a better term so yeah definitely check it out i'll link it below in the show notes for you guys to see yourself but it's definitely for a worthy one there to start off things um what else have i been doing over the weekend over the weekend the la, 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 went to paris dudes oh watch Manchester united absolutely obliterate bournemouth that was a good that was a good result in it that was a very very interesting match and um quite possibly a good indication as to how far uh, how far along united are in the current transformation that oligana social is currently bringing to the team um i think it's fair to say right is it fair to say is it ooh, where are you? Oh, it's gonna change i think it's fair to admit right now that we probably got it wrong about Oli, didn't we? In terms of what he was trying to do with the club. We probably all got it wrong collectively. I think we need to kind of hold our hands up. I think it's pretty obvious, right? We've seen that he's probably not going to be the most tactically astute manager, right? He's not going to, you know, be able to make changes in the first half when we're losing 3-0 to sort of like change the tide of the game. 
he probably won't be able to improve really basic players in the same way that Jurgen Klopp has done with people like Henderson and, you know, um, Trent Alexander-Arnold and even, to a lesser extent, um, what's his name? Oh, the striker up front, the black dude. I forgot anyway, but, you know, Solskjaer is never going to be Pep Guardiola. He's never going to be Mourinho in his pomp. He's probably never going to be Klopp in terms of how he improves players. But what we can see so far is that what he's good at and what he's probably been perfect for is because he's in the United legend, because he has quite a personable personality and he comes across really well. Um, he's always smiling. He's always kind of happy that he has a job sort of thing. Right? He's just grateful to be in that position. He's a complete... Um, opposite of how it must have been working under Jose Mourinho right especially the last season before he got fired um he was obviously quite dour influence in the dressing room in some parts he was pretty toxic and he pitted players against each other which I didn't necessarily like and we didn't necessarily have the players or the characters needed that could basically withstand that level of psychological torment right or kind of pressure that he was trying to probe and prod them so to a reaction but they're just not good enough to play at, at that time right and you saw his treatment with Luke Shaw you just you know you knew Luke Shaw didn't have the temperament or the whatever or to kind of respond well to that sort of um you know accusations that's not something that he's going to do really really well so what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer did really well which I think is something that needs to be highlighted a lot more is that he came in and essentially was able to be the proverbial arm around the shoulder right he was able to kind of lift up the players give them a give them an opportunity to play without any you know without feeling as if there was any pressure right they got to play for fun they got to really express themselves especially the first um few matches when the obvious tenure you really saw the impact that Solskjaer had over the squad and then over a period of time you hit a bit of a wall the players just couldn't necessarily pick up their levels they just had a ceiling that they could hit and now we've seen with the addition of good players right and with the addition of players coming back from injury and the addition of being able to pick a consistent team he has this team playing a really really good football and that's something that we have to really kind of acknowledge so Solskjaer might not be Mourinho he might not be Klopp he might not be Pep Guardiola but what he is is a very good manager because that's able or a really good man manager that's able to kind of do well as long as he's got the players so if the board want us to get back to the top if they want us back to challenging for a Premier League title challenging for a Champions League they're going to need to get him the best players possible the players that match obviously the overall culture he's going for you can see he wants people he would obviously prefer players that are going to bleed for the badge but that's kind of you know it's, it's a bit unrealistic to expect everyone to come in and be a fan of United but he at least wants players actually want to be there and he also wants players that are willing to sort of sacrifice themselves for their teammates right they're willing to sort of like put their own ego to one side as we've seen with Paul Pogba for instance right Paul Pogba has essentially um, occupied this position of deep lining midfielder right he's in a two midfield pivot Right, right in front of the centre backs, where he kind of you know swaps position between him and Matic, but Matic is probably the one that falls a bit deeper. Popper sort of acts like the quarterback role, but he's been very disciplined. He sort of reminds me of the way he played with France in the World Cup. He picks up the ball, he breaks between the lines, he pushes balls between the lines, he cuts balls over the top. He just keeps them moving over, tickling in a really good, and efficient way in midfield, which allows someone like Bruno Fernandes, who probably has a little bit more of a knack of going forward, to attack the spaces and kind of assist the front three that we have at the moment that are just blistering, right? Mason Greenwood, um, Anthony Marshall, and obviously Ra Marcus Rashford, who's probably been a bit off the boil, but so far so good. And the Bournemouth game was a good example of that. I think in games gone prior, once we went down especially because we had the, we were putting the pressure on Bournemouth we probably had most of the possession we were kind of bring it to them but then Bournemouth ended up scoring a goal on the counter which kind of stuns us you know very well taken goal you have to say in that regard um, Maguire was probably at fault there um, for his inability to turn quickly in the box that's something we probably have to look at and the finish as well was pretty tidy even though you know you'd argue that De Gea should be getting beaten at his near post. I still think Junior Stanislas did well to sort of like give him the eyes and nick it um, where De Gea wasn't looking. But I think in years gone by, we would have essentially lost that match probably. We would probably have lost that match 2 1, 3 1. But for the entire game, I never felt um, I was always confident that we were going to come back and sort of hit them. And essentially, we did. We were able to score two quick goals before half time, which, you know, essentially gave us the platform to build upon in the second half. And even when they did get a goal back to make it 3 2, 
in the second half we still were able to sort of like stretch things forward and i think um it's worth highlighting of course Anthony Martial's goal it's worth highlighting Mason Greenwood's goals and his performances one on either foot left foot or right foot there is no favorite foot of his but i just think it was an excellent team performance i just think it's um pleasure it's a pleasure now to watch us play um i think in years gone by it was a chore right you didn't actually i think um gary neville said this once before you didn't actually like the players in our squad right they kind of came across a little bit you know they came across a bit pathetic right they were lucky to be there they all sort of like i remember one quote being attributed to phil jones where he was sort of angry that he wasn't starting more right there was a sort of entitlement and arrogance about some of the united players where they felt like just because they play for the club it was enough already right um but we didn't necessarily have anything to compare them with right because we that's just all we had we didn't really know what the good life was like and then as soon as bruno fernandez comes in and the addition of uh you know uh um the addition of AWB, the addition of Harry Maguire, the, the the solidity in our team, the reintroduction of Matic in our team as well. It's made the players who are not performing look worse, but it's also allowed us to correctly assess where our missing points are and for that to be addressed hopefully coming in the summer. And I guess my overall hope is that we don't do that United thing where we get content and we think we don't need to make any changes, right? We don't need to make any additional signings because we still need to have players that come off the bench of at least the same quality or in the same caliber of class as the players we have playing on the pitch at the moment. And I think that's necessary at the moment um, going forward. If we want to win the Premier League, want to win Champions League, we need that. Um, anything other than that, it's just not going to be a success, I don't think so. So, But yeah, good to see us performing well again. Good to see us back um, essentially beating the teams that we should be beating, right? The teams that are... Um, in the second half of the table these are games that if we're you know in the years gone by under Sir Alex Ferguson we would be winning them without even thinking too much but you know recent years those have become our sort of like our bogey teams or uh, but yeah essentially been our bogey teams that we sort of kind of come up short against right we would beat a, a Tottenham away but we would go to like a Brighton and lose but now we essentially be able to beat these teams home and away and I hope we can build on that next season but yeah great match overall um, again props to Oli we probably proved us all wrong in it he proved he probably proved us all wrong next on the list here do, 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 do. what else um oh watch the jeffrey epstein filthy rich documentary that was an interesting watch um i'm assuming most people are kind of au fait with the whole jeffrey epstein Jillian maxwell story and you know the entire the severity of the um, sexual abuse that was going on with minors uh, trafficking kids through state lines through country lines right just an incredibly sadistic sad and brutal story but what kind of what really illuminated the story for me and what kind of brought it to the light and made me think was that it's there were so many things that Jeff, there's so many aspects of Jeff Epstein's story that are interesting right the idea that he is quite possibly a Mossad agent right um the the possibility that he's being funded by these shady big corporations uh, are essentially in it to undermine the security of the United States the fact that J Maxwell's dad died in unsuspicious circumstances the fact that her sisters twin sisters are you know was selling arms to foreign countries there's some really mad things that to you know associate with the story but at the core of it what was really disappointing was that what you saw was that for however much of a monster jeffrey epstein is was um he was aided and abetted by you know uh you know uh, a willfully ignorant a willfully unaware police force right in florida that essentially turned a blind eye when it was reported to them that he sexually assaulted a couple of girls two, two sisters at the time right early on and then um through his connections with powerful figures in politics and you know in various fields of business he was able to evade really capture or arrest in any meaningful way for a long 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 time and then the most harrowing part of it was the fact that towards especially when he started to ramp it up he was essentially helped by the fact that he was you know he would make a move on a particular girl she would reject it and he would then offer them the opportunity to kind of join on as a i don't know as a recruitment specialist in terms of getting other women that were or other young girls that were willing to come to his mansion and massage him and these women who again maybe their age you can excuse them because they were young but 
they were wit they were witnesses and they knew firsthand the kind of monster this guy was he then offers them an opportunity to recruit their friends and they willfully accept they accept under the premise that they're going to be paid 200 dollars for every person that they bring in so they're giving an incentive to sort of hire as many people as they can and you know you only have to imagine that if you're that woman that goes out and hires more girls to then get abused you're definitely looking for a particular kind of profile a woman right a particular kind of profile of young girl at, a, at that time you want somebody that probably isn't going to ask too many questions somebody that probably is in dire straits or in dire straits right needs the money somebody who's probably family life isn't where it should be that's the part that really hit me a bit i was like bloody hell man like not only was he able to corrupt people in office people in politics people in the police department he was also able to corrupt young girls minds so that they could in an instant forget the abuse that they were subjected to that they didn't probably you know accept they didn't probably um they weren't probably up for doing but he was able to corrupt them so much to the extent that they were willing and able to put their friends quote unquote on the firing line that's the bit that really hit me i was like god damn it man what a monster and it's really similar to the stories you hear of serial killers very rarely do you hear a serial killer story where um some level of incompetence wasn't at fault for their long stretches of time where they're going around murdering mad people it's usually some kind of inept police force somebody overlooking something family members being willfully ignorant or friends and family aiding and abetting that person it's very rarely somebody's able to inflict that level of damage on their own there's usually other people that are cooperating with it that's the most painful part of the story and again i think we'll after watching the documentary they don't really highlight it too much they sort of like you know give it more of a simple Sympathetic. they're a bit more sympathetic to the idea that these girls were young at the time but i don't know man if somebody comes onto you and you don't are not up for it and it's a really seedy and sadistic environment the last thing you should be doing is putting your friends in the firing line or your siblings even right there's a story of someone recommending their siblings to it and them getting abused as well and it's like <clears throat> i don't know how you could live with yourself man it must be a really hard pill to swallow that you are kind of indirectly responsible for the abuse that your friends or your siblings were under and again it's not their fault you know jeffrey epstein was the one he was the monster he was a sadist but part of it you're just like god damn it man god damn it what did he have of these people that they all kind of turned a blind eye and allowed him to kind of conduct himself in this way and now you know we have the great news that jelly maxwell has finally been captured and um, we're going to see how that story kind of unfolds hopefully she doesn't get suicided before her day in court quote unquote but god damn it man the amount of pain he was able to inflict and the amount of you know and that's the that's the, probably the other part of it that's extremely upsetting right he was essentially able to you know he, he's he didn't get away with it because i'm sure he's gonna whatever karma that was best, was due to him is gonna follow him into the next life but he essentially was able to avoid any sort of judicial consequences he signed over his estate to the virgin islands so none of the um um so none of the accusers could get any money from his estate which is a real scummy move at the end of it as well but you know having him being given opportunity to kill himself or him being killed in the first place was just such a slap in the face of the victims to go through all of that to essentially put your life on the line to risk your reputation being besmirched in public because for sure you know you, you know epstein's lawyers would have destroyed those girls you know without any 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 sort of regret or you know sympathy so to see all that kind of go on and happen you're just like god damn it man but again happy justice is being served in some way shape or form obviously all the all the uh, i guess all the blame would then fall on to Julianne Maxwell, which you know no one's really got any sympathy for her in that regard. She's going to bear the brunt of it. But it'd be interesting to see what happens next. Do we get Prince Andrew? Does he get extradited to the US? Probably unlikely. Do other big figures, do the Dershowitz and stuff, get accused? Are there other people in government who are complicit? Um, the Acosta dude who essentially gave Epstein a sweetheart deal in the first place in Florida. Does he get pulled up on some sort of co conspirator charges? I'm wondering what happens in everything. Obviously, probably not, I think, because they all got immunity, didn't they, when he first got accused in Florida. But some of the people involved, I think they even had um, images of, like, really well-known models and, you know, socialites that were that were kind of hired as... that were sort of hired by Epstein to bring other girls into the ring. And it's just... Oh, it's sadistic, man. It's sad. But 
a really well done documentary um again it's probably the perfect length for episodes it need to be any longer than that check it out it's on netflix now at the moment it's called jeffrey epstein filthy rich it's a very eye-opening one i recommend you see it before it's gone next on the list here what else do we have the pubs reopened the pubs reopened what a gallivanting good time so super saturday happened right i mentioned at the start of the show super saturday was when the uk government allowed pubs across the uk to open their doors from i'm gonna say it was like 6 a.m in the morning right because when that news first broke everyone was like, oh my god what are they doing then we sort of understood that they didn't want the pubs to open on a friday at like you know 30 minutes past 12 or one minute past 12 they wanted everyone to open sort of like at a reasonable time so they kind of gave them the 6 a.m um opening time so that you know most of the pubs wouldn't open at that time they're gonna open at eight probably the earliest and then um there was a lot of hesitation around it i think a lot of people were rightfully worried about the situation because i think a lot of people are still um under i still probably correctly thinking we don't really deserve pubs and bars to be open we haven't necessarily got the virus that much under control but considering the level of effort that's gone in considering how uncooperative we are as a country and considering the good work that we've done so far it probably made some sense that we were able the government was like you know what let me give you a little bit of an olive branch right and i think it probably came the right amount of time people are already going nuts there's already way too many illegal parties going on around the country forest raves and warehouse parties were getting disrupted and people's and people just you know were trying to essentially freak out and get a bit crazy so i think offering us a bit of an olive branch by opening up the salons and the bars was a great way to sort of appease everybody for the long stretch that's going to um go on with this virus i think anyone that thinks we're going to return to normal before august is probably smoking mad amount of kush we're definitely going to be under lockdown for or under you know this sort of like restricted movement for a while probably until september um so i think this was probably the way to sort of appease everybody and get people to sort of like settle down right if you can go out to, to a bar and have a pint if you can go out and have a steak if you can go out and have a haircut you essentially have some you know you have some freedom of movement um, you get given some sort of leeway it does go a long way especially if it's going to last until september um so yeah everything went over pretty well really and here's a little roundup video on youtube that sort of um, expounds on what essentially happened during the whole time I'll quickly play for you here in the background pub life is back but different the old familiar is unfamiliar stickers leading to the bar hand sanitizer on the wall and you need to give your details for track and trace on entering i'm just glad to get back and have a few pints <laughs> and then that's the bottom line <laughs> At the same time, it's a risk opening the pubs, but we've got to think of pe people's mental health as well. I thought it'd be a lot busier than it is, but it's nice to kind of get back to normal. There is a thrill to the near normality. Theme parks are open if you book in advance. Thorpe Park in Surrey took 2,000 visitors today, a fifth of its capacity. The Swarm roller coaster soars through a post-apocalyptic world and post-lockdown adds to the strangeness. Seats are sanitised between the rides of masked thrill-seekers. How does it feel? Uh, different. Yeah. It's not as quite a good buzz as it the, usually yeah, the is. The atmosphere is not as good, um, because there's not many people here, but that's nice, because the queues are lower. I literally just went on bumper cars loads. All you need to do is have a mask to go on a ride now. It just feels normal again. It's nice to have that normalisation, just... Yeah. It feels good, yeah. It's a bit yeah. disappointing they're not all open, but obviously government guidelines, it has to be a certain degree of safety. And that's the interesting part about things reopening. I think I, I read a few stories about this in the States. It seems like businesses are willing to open, right, under COVID-19 safety regulations, right? They don't have any real problem with it. You can train up your staff. You can probably put the right protocols together to make sure everything's safe and sanitized and all that malarkey. But it's going to take a real, real long time to... Um, to get the public back on board to for them to feel like it's safe enough to go back out um especially if you add to the fact that i think people's habits have just changed i think um what brian chesky from airbnb said recently which i mentioned on the podcast from airbnb where he mentioned that um international travel is going to change forever i think it's really true i think people are going to be a lot more local they're probably going to travel less to far-flung places in order to have some sort of fun with their friends so it's only natural that 
those same decisions to travel will also change how people interact with their you know entertainments and cultural events in their city or in a town that they live in it's only going to be it's only going to change for the best i think going forward but unfortunately these small businesses are going to suffer you know bars restaurants theater places zoos and stuff they're going to suffer somewhat because people have essentially had three months plus to essentially look re-analyze how they interact with their city and town how they communicate with their friends and at the heart of it as long as you've got friends around in regards if you're sitting in a huddle in a park somewhere regardless if it's on a bench somewhere regardless if you're in some shoddy pub that's all you really need you don't really need the extra added bells and whistles so the businesses are going to have to either <coughs> evolve and adapt or they're gonna have to ch change they have just got to offer more to the customers that's what they have to kind of entice them with a lot more than just being open and i've been prior a lot of these restaurants or these bars were just content enough just to be open and that'll be enough but i think now in the post covid world you're going to need to offer the customers a lot more than that let the video continue ultimately this is an experiment nobody knows what this easing back to normality will bring and a lot will depend on how we behave and whilst it is essential for the economy it is also a potential opportunity for the virus. Now, the government t tells us that the R factor is between 0.7 and 0.9 still. That R factor is already too high if we're trying to get rid of the virus in Britain as quickly as possible. With pubs, bars, restaurants, hairdressers uh, and cinemas uh, opening today, I can only advise people be utterly cautious. For many, the real excitement worth queuing for today was a simple haircut. It's my first time back in the salon since before lockdown, and um, I'm finally being pampered, and it feels great. Um, hopefully get my colour sorted, have my hair cut. Thank goodness. <laughs> what makes this Saturday super depends on what you've been missing. For some, it's bingo. Others might have to wait till Wednesday when the National Gallery becomes the first major art museum to reopen. The message is be careful. Having climbed out of lockdown, we are dipping into the unknown. Jason Fa and it's very true. And I guess the, one of the best things, again, I keep mentioning it as a little silver lining, but we've probably been able to appreciate the things, you know, it probably gave us a, a different sort of understanding about what we appreciate in life you know what matters the most and again you know probably prior to covid you were you know looking for these external factors to make your life more wholesome but now you've sort of whittled them down to some really basic amenities right like being able to go to the gym we we'll be able to do that you see it being able to order a steak and a glass of wine right you can do that in a moment being able to order a pint being able to order some food in the restaurant not having to clean up yourself those things are you know probably a lot more important now to you than they were prior and i guess that um rejigging of priorities is a good thing isn't it going forward and i think again just considering how crap has been here in the uk in most of the country and most of europe and most of the world i think people are a bit more appreciative apart from north america of course if you live in america you're you're you know you're screwed you have to first convince people there's a real virus in the first place but i think in places where we accept it's true it's just a it's a way of i don't know i guess if you look at what's happening in new zealand you'd say they've probably got a lot more cooperation there amongst their citizens and this in terms of how they go about combating it but in places where people are skeptical you have to just try and work with what you've got and for the most part we've done okay we've done pretty okay i think for the most part it hasn't been as bad as i thought it would be but that isn't to say that it could get you know it could get essentially worse what it's like a two-week period by the time to find out what's happened this weekend but so far it's been pretty cool and i think one other interesting part that i love about it is how it looks like in central london right we've got all these chairs and tables out in soho where people are able to have a bit more of a continental feel in terms of how they go out and i think that's been a really good part of lockdown it's allowed us to really maybe reimagine how we use our spaces in london which is you know we don't have much space anyway right it's a bit of a um clusterfuck but i think overall it's been pretty cool. this is a video on youtube someone oh, something for the sun actually of people around right you've got basically crowds all gathering around soho where the streets are basically closed up and the streets it's not too bad to look at actually it's, it's quite fun i'd say may have been the minority here but 
because there is a feeling among some people that you know most of the roads in Soho should be closed on the weekends anyway right especially um in the evening when people are going out having a bit of a booze up having a bit of a dance with their friends you don't really need to have cars you know zooming around the place um obviously you know black cab drivers are going to be annoyed you know delivery workers are going to be annoyed but i think it's a good thing going forward in general and for the most part you know we are, we've known now that the virus can't really spread that well outside in the outside environments and you know if you keep your distance you'll be able to do it well but looking at this crowd is pretty difficult to keep your distance when you're outside <laughs> moving around but I, I quite I quite like the look of it. I think the look of it is pretty cool. People have loads of disposable income because they've probably been sitting at home not doing anything, right? There's only so many Uber Eats you can order and indulge yourself in, but all the money you're saving on travel and stuff has probably been helped as well. You'll be able to add that to your kitty of when you go dr drinking with your friends. <laughs> Yeah, just just a good is, thing. I think. Stay apart. There's tables of you know markings all over the places. I think tables of like six and seven, you know, spaced out one meter apart to make sure people don't get too close. Staff and waiters wearing masks and gloves and stuff. Not not too bad. I think it's actually a good thing to see a more metropolitan side of London. You know, utilizing the sidewalks like they do in Paris and stuff. So yeah, I think that's been a good thing really to see overall. Um, so yeah, let's see what happens the following weekends going forward. But I think people have dealt with it pretty well. I think there's been a bit of a mature response when it comes to our interaction with the city when things got opened up. Next on the list here. Du, 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 du. Oh, yeah. Um, this is a sad one. Um, on the other side, the, the more bleak side of what's happening with COVID. Um, RIP to Nick Cordero. Um the Broadway actor unfortunately passed away from complications due to COVID-19. Again, it's a pretty sad story. I was sort of following this from the outside and I never really heard of the dude prior to his um, positive uh, test for COVID. But he was one of the first sort of like high profile people outside of the Tom Hanks and his elbows that kind of got it. And unfortunately, his symptoms just kept getting worse and worse. It got to a point where he had to have his leg amputated. You know, just kind of so terrible to hear. Then you heard about his double lung transplant was going to happen. And now, unfortunately, he died through complications. He's only 41 years of age, man. And it's just a real bummer, really, isn't it? to see the different sort of effects and it has on different people. Um, it can sort of spring up on, you know, you hear of... Uh, you hear a sort of like uh, bus drivers getting it and essentially getting spat upon or coughed on by some random person in the street and then they're passing away somebody getting coughed on in the shop and nothing happening somebody getting it not knowing where they got it from and then suddenly passing away quickly deteriorating and then you get this story where essentially he was you know in a medically induced coma for the best part of more than two months I think but man R.I.P. to Nick Cordero and in you know, thoughts and feelings guide to his family but this is a story from The Hollywood Reporter it says the following he received a Tommy nomination for bullets over broadway and starred in waitress in brooks tale and musical rock of legends rock of ages sorry nick codero the charming tonio nominated actor known for his work in bullets over broadway uh, waitress in the bronx tale died sunday after a grueling battle with coronavirus his wife announced he was 41 since being diagnosed with that with what was thought to be a pneumonia in late March, the Canadian actor spent weeks in intensive care at Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, had his right leg amputated and lost more than 60 pounds, and was hoping to receive a double lung transplant. Like God Almighty. Cadera had come to LA to star at a bourbon room owner, Dennis Dupree, in an in immersive adaptation of the long-running Broadway hit Rock of Ages in a new space in the Hollywood Boulevard. He had played the role years ago in National Tour in Broadway and a new version of the musical opened in January. Survivors included survivors include his wife, fitness instructor and former body dance, uh, Broadway dancer Amanda Klotz, who chronicled his health struggles on social media, and their son Elvis, born on June 2019. Mamma mia, a one-year-old. A GoFundMe page has been set up to help the family. God has another angel in heaven now. Closer on Instagram, my daily husband, my darling husband, passed away this morning. He was surrounded by love. He was surrounded in love by his family, singing and praying as he gently left his earth. 
She said, I'm in disbelief and hurting everywhere. My heart is broken and I cannot imagine our lives uh, without him. Nick was such a bright light. He was such everyone's friend, loved to listen, help, and especially talk. He was incredible actor and musical musician. He loved his family and loved being a father and a husband. Um, Elvis and I will miss him everything we do every day. Bloody hell. In 2014, could have received a Tony nomination and a theatre award award uh, for his tap dancing turn as a ghostwriting crook. Uh, Cheesh in the musical adaptation of Woody Allen's Bullets Over Broadway, Chaz Palmer Terry, and earned the Oscar nom for his performance as Cheetah. Bloody hell, man. So, yeah, RIP, man. And again, just a reminder of just how serious of an issue this is, isn't it? You obviously, you don't need a celebrity to die to be to be reminded of it, but I think with places being eased in with the lockdown being eased in some places and things sort of going well in different sort of countries you can be forgiven to be a little bit lax and talk, take your foot off the pedal but especially for americans who have just they're in plain denial about what's going on and it this should be a wake-up call to really sort of like pay attention because for however serious a disease is for however serious the virus is it is easily avoidable for the most part right staying in place avoiding you know crowded rooms and spaces wearing a face mask if you have to go out washing your hands all that kind of basic stuff keeping distance essentially can allow you to avoid this virus for the most part um so if you can do that then why not do you know what I mean it's not it it'd be worse if it was <laughs> we'd be in a far different difficult situation we'd be in a far worse position now if the virus was you know way more aggressive it's still aggressive but in a way that it spreads right um if you avoid those things that i mentioned you're usually going to be okay so to have a whole country such as america have some people in the population who are still sort of on the fence about the severity of the issue is just it's just sad to see in general and it? it's just so sad to see but yeah i repeat to nicodera again thoughts and prayers guys to his family and friends and anyone that knew him again i followed the story from the onset when i sort of heard about what was going on just as a sort of case study on the issue i was kind of hoping and praying that he'd pull through but unfortunately he didn't um hopefully because it's such a public case people will come forward and be able to you know contribute to the girl family support his family any way they can that's the most we can do really because we're all kind of going through the same sort of mess up situation and you can only hope that it gets better for people going forward now and that these people that are passing away sort of act as a cautionary tale and are sort of able to be used as a case study to help people maybe later on down the line that's the most you can aim for it and as a silver lining that's the most you can hope for but yeah r.i.p nicodero man r.i.p next on the list here what else do we have ba, 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 ba. Do, 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 do. oh on the other side of it on the complete opposite side of um <laughs> hoping somebody family is better on it um brendan shaw and brian kind of fine kid have been you know the test positive for coronavirus should we be surprised probably not right i just think about it now uh bolsonaro right the president of brazil was recently tested positive obviously boris johnson our prime minister here in the uk didn't really treat it seriously and was bragging about going around touching people he got tested positive and these two comedians these two doofuses who were essentially part of the original crew of naysayers when it came to covid who were you know poo-pooing it saying it wasn't a real thing saying people were overreacting brendan shaw telling us about he was a stats guy and he was a numbers guy and it doesn't really matter who cares blah 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 now look at them they've both got it and part of me you know part of you'd be forgiven you'd be you know forgiven to be you know kind of punch in the air now i'm celebrating the fact that they both got it i don't think anybody would begrudge you for it. i don't think even brian callen the most sensible of the two would probably uh, begrudge you for feeling that way but it's just such an unfortunate situation right the fact that they all went together to go and perform i think in san antonio texas and they came back on the monday who were positive for corona and they've been so blase so flippant about the whole issue it just really makes you just kind of question your um question your optimism for humanity right because i think in the beginning when i sort of mentioned it about some of the protests or some of the people that were freaking out about having to wear a mask in a target or whatever right i was like you know what i'm okay with you if you're like look i've looked at the numbers if you have this position where you look at the numbers you're like hey it's only affecting a certain group of the pop it's only affecting a certain segment of the population um you sort of say you know um if you get it and you're under this age you're going to be okay blah blah blah, blah. you come to a, some sort of um informed 
decision about how you're going to live your life that's okay but to be willfully to be so wrong and loud which is what you see a lot of brendan right he's kind of encapsulated that idea about shouting things and saying things loudly repeating things again and again to make himself feel like he's correct and then to somehow then turn back around now right and i think he said it recently in the recent podcast that oh he if he would have known that having if he would have known pursuing you know going on tour and pushing to kind of go out and perform in front of live crowds that it would essentially put in position where he was unable to see his family for two weeks he would have done it and it's like what did you honestly not know that when you were ranting and raving on the Rogan podcast when you were talking all that nonsense on yours and essentially calling people that were being precaution being you know i remember there was an episode of fighting a kid where i think cat was wearing a mask and she kind of lied and said that she, she was because her face was cold and brenda sort of gave us look like oh are you one of those idiots that wears a mask and it's like bloody hell these people are insane in it like they don't want they don't want it to be real fair enough but it is but then they, they act as if it's not and then when it is they act surprised it's like bloody hell bloody hell so yeah this is just crazy news really yeah but obviously it was broken by brendan himself on social and he went about doing it you know the the most brendan Shaw way possible right he gets he, he announces he's got it via twitter in a kind of jokey way to sort of take off the shine of it which isn't jokey because you know he was a he was an ardent critic of a, being a critic of a virus is super strange anyway to be honest isn't it right it's not some sort of um intellectual battle right you're not being some sort of a rational thinker or critical thinker in that respect you're just being a bit of an idiot but he announces it on social this is from bloody elbow Brendan Shaw deletes posts of him taking a bike ride while COVID-19 positive yes you got that right he announced it on social media then posted on social that he was all going on a bike ride an absolute doofus um so it says here Brendan Shaw who has constantly downplayed the seriousness of the pandemic for months announced that he and his other colleagues have tested positive for COVID-19 the former UFC fighter says he has still has symptoms such as a lack of taste but he took a for three days and straight and started to feel better <coughs> which is already you know ridiculous in this in itself right the fact that this sort of anecdotal evidence is anything insightful we don't really give a shit the fact that you know from everyone with any sort of brain knows part of the reason why you're staying indoors and you're quarantining yourself is so that you don't end up spreading it to people that are more at risk than you are right no one really cares about your if you want to take the risk you know you're on your on, on yourself and go out there and perform in front of people fair enough but don't go out there and perform in front of people get positive and then spread it to people who are going to necessarily spread it to others who are more at risk than yourself so just to, to essentially be out there boasting about the the aspect of being able to get ivs right which is a like privilege in itself right if ever there was an expression of white privilege this is it and then to sort of <coughs> be I don't know how you call it. This is like being completely dismissive of his friends, right? I think one of one of these friends, Stevie Blue Eyes, it's been kind of let be known that he is a he was a cancer survivor prior prior, right? In his prior life to comedy. Um, so you'd imagine his immune system is somewhat compromised. So to have this virus ravaging all over his body, it probably isn't the best of situations. So imagine your friends putting you in that situation, right? You're where well, you're already immune compromised and you're putting yourself in a position where you can get a virus and your friend is telling you, Hey, at least I'm okay after three days. God almighty. It continues here. It says he didn't experience any of the intense symptoms that other people have and now feels vindicated that his views on the pandemic are right. He says he's curious to see how long this uh, corona fear is going to keep going, right? As if it's like it's a, I don't know, as if it's like um I don't know, as if it's some sort of made up fear, like, you know, there's these ISIS terrorists, sleeper cells in our country just waiting to activate any moment. It's just like, no, this is not it. This is a real thing. He continues, it says, um, um, I sure did, Brian. Shops responded after being asked by Curse if you're on a bike ride. He said, I did 15 miles today, right? And he posted this picture, you know gloating arrogant you know 20 mile co 20 mile corona ride thick boy bike club got that little stupid smirk, smirk on his face which i'm assuming he did partly in response to the fact he was getting a lot of stick online you know he's the first person to tell you he doesn't read comments and he doesn't engage online but he does he's on it all the time so he probably felt as if people were getting at him too much the fact that he was he went you know he was the naysayer he was doubting his severity and went out there went on tour did provide to perform in front of crowds did meet and greets hugged strangers 
And then he goes out of the background to sort of like as a middle finger to all the naysayers and like, no, everything's okay after three days. It's like, we don't care if you feel okay. Other people might not feel okay later. Just stay your house at home for the 14 days that you're required. And then if you decide to go on for a four mile bike ride or you decide to go and perform in front of people again somewhere, do as you please. But for that two week period, just, you know, put yourself to one side and sort of, you know, allow yeah don't be so selfish i guess in that regard isn't it? that's what you'd hope but it doesn't happen that way um it said i'm sure did uh, let's continue here it says um bah, 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 online bike rides have grown more in popular home workout recently during lockdowns but that doesn't seem to what your show did the ufc veteran seems to have broken quarantine and went on an actual bike ride while he was contagious and positive for the virus madness short took the social media to post his corona ride which shows him outdoors without a mask and this time claiming that he did 20 miles on his bike the post has since been deleted but the screenshots i've seen below courtesy of a reddit user like god almighty imagine the kind of the level of contempt this guy must have for just humans in general his fan base his own family and then the funny bit about this is that obviously in this in you know the recent episode he then goes on to say what did they say? Let me see if I can find the clip. Where he says that he regret he didn't know, right? Let's see if I can find it. So this is, I think, this is after post posting, you know, or after he got confirmed it was a positive test. He get, then goes on to say this. Let me see if I can get out for you. Da, 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 da. Where essentially, I think, Callan essentially kind of admits they were idiots, and Brendan kind of refuses to say say as much. Hopefully, it loads up. Boom, boom, boom. Come on, let's get this computer loading. Bear for bear with me one second. Is it going to load? Nope. There to be go. fair, what else is there to do? To be fair, what else is there to do now? Hello? No, you're right. You're right. I'm, I'm saying that the women in my family tend to, like, they're, my mother's telling me I should be checking my blood oxygen level. And uh, I could fall off a cliff on the week two because a lot of men, she knows four men that fell off a cliff on the week two because a lot of men, she knows four men that fell off a cliff. They were fine and boom. And so she's worried about me. And I'm like, all right. Fell off and like they died or they just got worse? Well, they're no, you get worse. You get worse. So. Yeah, how about, how about I told my dad, you know, I finally told him and he, I tell him, I go, Dad, I'm, I actually have pretty mild symptoms. It's not a big of a deal. And then pause for about five seconds and he goes yeah it's like, come on man. that's fair it's like people want you know. it's like people want you to have worse symptoms yeah we do possibly you bro brendan specifically we do want you to have worse symptoms we do we actually do some people are actually wishing for your death which is you know a bit too far for me in my experience but some people do want you to see you on an <laughs> on uh on a bed somewhere stretched out covered in you know medical gowns some people do want to see that unfortunately when you're that much of an idiot when it comes to this virus that's killing people it's a natural reaction it's like what's wrong with people man? a lot of people wish we were way sicker and i don't blame them because we've been talking a big fucking game like exactly. idiots. we've been fucking like blah 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 about covid now both of us have it i'm fucked up i deserve it you, the, the, i wasn't the, careful here's the thing i don't here. know how by the way you know how we got it i'm telling you how we got it you can say whatever you want and and this is where Brendan's lack of humility shows, right? Brendan, Ken's going to go on an entire diatribe about why he thinks they got it, why they're responsible for him. Look at Brendan's face for that entire thing. When we're coming off stage, first of all, it didn't help that the... We shared fucking, a mic, too. We shared a mic. It's not that. I'm going to tell you what it is, because we all came in there negative. What happened was we happened to have gone to the one county that was the hot spot in the United States. We got an Amber Alert on our phone Saturday. Well, the show's got to go on. on. Stage, we got an Amber Alert. I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's crazy. Because remember, when we got there Thursday, despite, well, I read, I think it was Friday, that sp cases had spiked in Arizona and Texas. So I was like, oh, you know, but well, we were already there. And so we were in the hot spot in San Antonio, and we were on stage with 350 people, whatever, who were laughing in our direction. Mm -hmm. And so that's an aerosol. Mm -hmm. And then when we yeah. got off stage, because of the way a uh, LOL they were killing so hard that's why they got it basically right if you're not you know kind of currently following along they were killing that's why they got it because people were laughing so hard and the room was so packed they were bound to get it Problem is we had to walk through the entire crowd people are standing up and they're 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 you know Andrew. talking to you ryan brennan and they're laughing and they're so you're getting all of that spittle yep that's what happens yeah you're probably right 
Yeah, I mean, they, they, there's, so aside from being in a hazmat suit, that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. the, the, the larger issue is, you know, should we have gone in the first place? But I, again, I say, well, the, Probably board not. Of the Board of Health and the state and the club okayed that. They okayed it. In I fact... So let's just for a minute imagine what their finances must be like for them to decide to take that risk though right just imagine what it must be like just that's the thing that's worrying about i think unless you're like a rogan you know you've got 200 mil approximately or allegedly from spotify for the most part most of these guys are doing pretty well via podcasts they put on youtube right from the adsense from the sponsors they get it's not a bad occupation for most of them so to put yourself at risk and your family at risk to go back on road must really make you think what their monthly nut must be and it must be high and if ever and if any if ever there must be a this is probably a, a good a sort of good cautionary tale in terms of how to in making sure you keep your nut low make sure you keep your monthly expenditure as low as you can do even if you're making money hand over fist because there's going to come a point where you're going to need to make that really difficult decision about whether you go out and earn some money hoping in the hopes you know until you go yeah you're gonna have to make the decision of whether or not you should go out put your life at risk to earn money in order to kind of keep your family fed and sheltered or whether you put yourself in a position where you don't need to do that and you've got a bit of savings something you know in the bank that you can sort of dip into whilst everyone's kind of under lock and key but for some for people in their position they don't have to work in an office they're not working for a corporation they're essentially doing it you know on their own dime they have their own timetable their own studio to be in a position where you have to go out and tour you have to go and perform in front of live state in live crowds probably does show how maybe not irresponsible they've been with their money but just how so probably what's that word called when you they just assume that the good times are going to keep rolling on right i think someone mentioned it previously like how people sometimes think brendan sort of has this idea that he's going to keep getting richer as time goes on and i think people maybe he has the he ha, he's, he's well <clears throat> maybe you have the right to think that right if especially if you've done as well as brendan does considering his lack of you know acumen and his lack of awareness and everything of himself the fact that he's got this far in his career is really amazing in that way shape or form so maybe he has every right to believe that he is going to just get exponentially richer as time goes on but that's a really a a naive assumption to make isn't it especially under the current climate who's to say things will return back to normal who like as we've proven with the other clip i showed you before of the pubs reopening the pubs have reopened but people don't want to go so to assume that you're suddenly going to be able to tour again the same level when things reopen is just ridiculous anyway right it might mean you might have to be on road more because there's less capacity so you might have to make you might have to do two shows to pay that were going to pay you the same shows that would have paid you Fifty thousand, you might have to do two of them or three of them to kind of make up that same amount so it's a really bizarre situation to be in just looking at it from the outside and again don't know anything about their finances nothing what's going on but you'd expect two successful podcasters who've been at it for a long time associated with rogan you know there's already a bit of a bump there a bit of you know but you get a bit of a rub being standing next to that guy to be in a position where they have to go out on tour have to put their families at risk have to put their own health at risk it's just insane <clears throat> I mean, if I could to the point it. where we weren't even restricted, we I think we had we were allowed to be more than seventy five percent of capacity. Yeah, I know. I mean, so if, if I could redo it, I wouldn't have gone. So. I'm me too. I've been humble again. Oh, I apologize. I... I understand. We have to be everybody. Too late now, isn't Careful, it? listen to us talking now. You got to If you've been exposed, you just got to be more careful. I guess anyone that was listening to these guys and you know when they came to Corona, you probably, you know, and, and imagine the people that went to their shows, how dumb they must feel, right? Of all the shows to kind of, you know, we saw that. Do you remember when you saw the Dave Chappelle comedy special and you're like, wow, I wish I was in that crowd. Would you have really felt the same thing about being in the Brendan Show and Brian Callen audience? No disrespect to those guys, but is that really the show that you want to go to to break quarantine and it makes you think just how detached they must be from their circle of friends because i remember watching a few episodes of other people's podcasts right in the comedy scene and they were all quite hesitant about going out they didn't want to be the person that was going out first and that was going to essentially get it or have a member of the audience get it right no one wanted that press because you know everyone can say what they want about all you know all bad press and there's no such thing as bad press but in this instance what's going on in the world at the moment having you know putting your fans or your supporters at risk and essentially uh spreading it unbeknownst to you is 
probably not the best look you will probably get cancelled it's unlikely they will get cancelled because again i think you know if you're self-sufficient and you have 1000 true fans and you've got some cash reserves you should be okay but you're, you're probably going to put yourself in a lot of bother you're probably going to you know test your agency's desire to represent you in that regard so yeah just a very very bizarre situation now we learn of course the development that is that chin the other dude has got has been has probably got covid as well he said he's been feeling a bit ill um there's no know who else they've probably unknowingly spread it to and it's just a complete and utter shit show and again i just think um it's probably a cautionary tale for the djs in the scene as well right outside of the comedy circle in the scene that i'm most associated with the yeah, nightlife industry you just need to be able to if you're going to go somewhere to go before make sure it's somewhere where it's covid safe don't go somewhere where it's sort of like ramping up and it's going a bit crazy because god damn it man they've sort of set themselves back now and you know la is going to probably ramp up the restrictions and stuff but bloody hell what a shitty situation for everybody involved and then um lastly to kind of uh finish up on this i'm gonna see should we play a bit of this yeah this woman's debate on cnn was pretty insightful about the other side of covid or what's happening in terms of um barton isn't it and how they're sort of handling it and going forward i think her debate was pretty enlightening in terms of trying to understand why there's some bar owners out there managers or p owners of businesses who are hesitant to accept the mandate being bestowed upon them to close up their businesses because they don't necessarily want to put their employees at risk in terms of having no future being able to earn no money and they also want to be able to run their businesses isn't it they want to be able to take that calculated risk i'm not really opposed to it i think if you want to open your doors and customers are willing to come in then do what you will need to do but i think mandate everyone to close up shop especially when most governments aren't necessarily putting into anything anything into anything in place unless yeah apart from maybe the further that we have in the uk that's allowing some companies to claim up to 80 percent of salaries to pay whoever they kind of want to keep on most governments are sort of just allow you know leaving businesses to sort of you know fend for themselves so if you're going to do that you have to expect or you have to be accepting of some people resisting and just wanting to open their business up and do what they want to do but i thought this debate on cnn was really really insightful i'm gonna play it for you now some Texans are pushing back against uh, some of the governor's rollbacks to reopening as coronavirus cases soar in the state. Dozens of bar owners, for example, are suing the governor for shutting down their bars, claiming the closures are unconstitutional, and many say that they are on the verge of bankruptcy. Health experts say bars are perfect breeding grounds for the virus. So, Gabrielle Ellison is one of those bar owners suing the governor, and she owns Big Daddy Zanes in Odessa, Texas. And then Jared Woodfill is the attorney representing the group of bar owners. And so welcome to, to both of you. And, and Gabrielle, I just wanted to hear from, from you first, just briefly. Tell me why you want to defy the governor, you know, and defy the warnings from health officials and keep your bar open. Well, if, if I don't, I'm going to lose my bar. If I don't, my employees are not going to be able to eat. And, and I believe we have rights that are being trampled on right now um this is my life savings this is my daddy's life savings i can't can't afford to lose it i can't do it okay i want to come back to that with some counterpoints in a second but but, but jared I, then i want to hear from you because i know gabrielle is one of many bar owners you're representing in this lawsuit what is it that you're arguing like why should these bars remain open Sure. Well, there's a whole pro host of problems with Governor Abbott's order. Fast forward a little bit. Let's go back. Got nails or your hair done. You're wearing a mask. You're social distancing. If you argue that if it happens, they will have fast forward a little bit. Bear with me. Couple shots of tequila. Are you going to keep that mask on? I'm just saying there, there, there is another way to look at this. Let me, let me, let me, let me just offer a different perspective. Well, let me, let, hang on, hang on. Let me offer a different perspective. The nation's leading expert on infectious diseases and a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Fauci, says don't do it. Here he is. A uh, congregation at a bar inside is bad news. We really got to stop that right now when you have areas that are surging like we see right now. But in answer to your question, a little bit more granular, outdoor is always better than indoor. If you're outdoor distance, as Bob said, wear a mask if you can, but you can have some social interaction. But he says, Jared, specifically, bars really not good. I mean, again, this is the leading expert on infectious diseases in the country. Why is he well, let's wrong? Look. 
Sure. Well, let's look at his statements. In fact, I guess the the reason why I'd say he's wrong and the reason it's hard to listen to medical experts because they're always going to go for the they're always going to come to the worst case scenario, right? Their their job isn't to save the economy. Their job isn't to look for ways to sort of get out of this with the least amount of economic damage. Um, their job is to sort of look at this from a health perspective and you know essentially try and save as many lives as they can. And if it was up to a doctor, right? The moment you fall off a skateboard and you twist, you break your arm or you break or cr fracture your wrist, they probably won't allow you to skateboard again for the rest of your life, right? How many times have you heard of a story of an athlete succumbing to an injury and him and he or she being told by some sort of medical professional that they wouldn't necessarily walk again? They won't be able to use their arm again, their shoulder again, whatever it may be. And they always defy the odds for the most part, right? So it's their job to sort of lay down the worst case scenario so that you maybe, you maybe have something to fight against, maybe something to push against. I'm not too sure but to take their advice in terms of what a business owner should do i understand the reservations behind it i really do because if this woman ends up listening to dr fauci her business would never reopen again especially if you have no outdoor seating or outdoor spaces because this is under the assumptions that every bar has one and not everyone does <clears throat> like some of our bar owners a bar, a a bit. Bar yeah. savings account but but you were also arrested yeah no. let's hear this let's hear this no and to that Governor point Abbott to that picking... point to that point and hey this excellent point she makes regarding the bar owner right that she's actually taking money out of her from her savings to pay her staff members now because the government has stepped in to allow her any sort of assistance let me let me put, put this to, to gabrielle because i understand this is about protecting your employees you know you have been paying them i was reading the notes you know you've been paying them out of your own savings account but but you were also arrested a month ago for defying the order so so maybe you're not worried yourself about getting coronavirus but if you care as much as it sounds like you do about your own employees why would you want to put them in harm's way and it kind of feels a bit patronizing as well coming from a news broadcaster whose job has never is never going to be affected by coronavirus lockdown right the more we have to be stay in place and work from home she's going to have a job regardless the more times they're able to kind of drum up the unnecessary sort of fervor behind the virus and sort of like you know scaremonger people she's still gonna have a job the more political divided the united states are she's still gonna have a job so to be this patronizing to an actual business owner you actually have to put some money on the line has some skin in the game is really really disconcerting it kind of reminds me of like a k belly interview sure i care about him a lot uh and and i would i'd like to invite abbott and i'd like to invite Fulci and i'd like to invite them all to my bar i care about them we're not gonna we're not this is not gonna go away we have got to learn how to live with this and what i do care about is that their children eat i care about that they're they're able to pay their house payments and they're not out on the street but Gabrielle, people are dying. People are dying from this. I mean, we have all these numbers on the side of the screen of all these cases and all these deaths. You are you are putting people them are at, at harm's risk. Because of the economy. They are going to die because of the economy. What is it your right or anybody else's right to take our rights away? It is nobody's right. You don't have that right. We are going to starve. You might the rights thing, I, I'm a bit mismoved that one, but I do have sympathy for it. And again, I won't stop it there. You pl you can play the entire thing yourself. It's called Bar Owner Defense when it's to stay open despite warnings. I'll link in the show notes, but there is no real easy answer to that, isn't it, really? If you're a bar owner and you are not receiving any support from the government, the government doesn't seem to have any sort of idea how to deal with it properly, especially in the United States. They've sort of been it's incredibly haphazard. I mentioned before, I think the United States was a really waste of opportunity. They could have really done some interesting things and in how they could fight COVID in terms of how they, you know, independently govern each state. They could have done some interesting approaches, tried out some different experiments in terms of how they kind of bring it um under some sort of you know under some sort of level of control but they haven't they all sort of like you know essentially either turned a blind eye collectively or just put on the baby gloves but with no real direction from the people that you vote in power to sort of help put make you make these kind of tough decisions businesses are going to, have to make the tough decisions themselves and so are the customers and patrons that sort of you know um visit these places on a daily or weekly basis if they want to take the risk and go to a bar and hang out they they're more than willing to they have to do, accept the consequences and so are the bar owners right if they have you know one positive covid test they're going to get locked down for good so i don't necessarily know what the right answer is but i know the not the best option is having some news broadcaster kind of you know patronize you on tv and make you feel like an idiot or make you feel as if like you're not compassionate because you're, you're putting <clears throat> people's lives at risk when in fact if you don't get your employees back 
not um, employed or you don't allow them to earn a living, they're also going to have their family's lives put at risk because they're going to be able to pay their bills or not be able to pay their rent, not be able to put their kids through school or provide them with meals. And these are all things that the US government doesn't seem to be willing and or able to step in and do for people, right? You've got Trump here bragging about putting up the wall still and not really providing any sort of support, not really quelling people's fears or inspiring any kind of hope. It's just a really bizarre place to be in. But again, you'd never, who'd have thought in 2020 you'd see a battle between a biz, small business owner and a new broadcaster about how they should best operate their business. It really is an encapsulation of what's happening in 2020, and it? it really, really is. Anyway, that has been the Excellent Thing Show episode number, what? I'm just going to say it's 337. It probably is, right? 337. If it's your first time tuning in, or I think it's a free free yeah, whatever episode it is, thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If you're watching via the YouTube, of course, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcasting app, please leave me a four star review and share with your friends. But until then, take care. Thanks for tuning in and sign off.